Welcome to Latino Talk TV. I'm your host, Ben Mendez, and joined today by Mr. Hector De Leon from Harris County. In case you don't know who he is, he is the one that actually runs our campaigns, or actually our elections, in Harris County. And I will tell you, he is full of knowledge, and today we're going to talk numbers. What happened in the previous election? What's going on? Actually, there's a lot going on, but what really happened on election day? And there's so many things that people have been talking about, Hector. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for and, inviting me. And I really wanted to take the opportunity to tell our viewers that you are the man in the know in Harris County. If you ever have a question regarding elections, this is the guy to go to. And well, I will tell you, go ahead. The first thing I have to tell you is that actually the county clerk, who is uh, my boss, Dan Stannard, is the chief elections officer of the county, and he is the one that runs the elections. Uh, I can tell you that uh, he gets the credit for it, but the people under him actually do the Right. He, we have an elections administrator, and we have a lot of uh, support staff that Absolutely. does the work, but he, we as an office, that he should be uh, the one that is mentioned as when, who is the head. And okay, we'll give him boss. some credit. We'll give him some credit. <laughs> So let, let's talk a little bit about the uh, election day. I, I know that we had a lot of issues uh, on election day uh, regarding the actually machines that were not in place or there was a lack of machines. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, some confusion when it comes to uh, what they call the primary elections and in comparison to a general election. The uh, primary elections or elections that by law are conducted by the political party so they can nominate the, the candidates they're going to represent their party in the November election. And by code, uh, the chair of each political party and the executive committee of each party is actually responsible for the conduct of the primary elections, which means that every decision that is made uh, pertaining to how many polls, polling locations are going to be, uh, who's going to staff the polls, uh, how, many, how much equipment is going to be allocated. Uh, every decision, final decision that is made is with the approval of the chair and their executive committee. Obviously, because the elections office is experienced and um, we provide guidance, however, whatever it is we say, they can actually come and say, well, you know, if we say, you know what, you may need uh, six machines for that poll, they could say, well, you know what, they just give us four, we can do it four because we expect a low turnout. And whatever it is they say, we will, we will respond to whatever request they want. Uh, it's their elections and that's what we do. I, I would tell you that I was really disappointed with the Democratic Party and that they merged many of the precincts in Magnolia there was four precincts that vote there. They merged them into one precinct at Decevala Park. And I know the Democratic Party had a lot to do with that. I wonder what's going on behind the scenes that people don't realize. Uh, there's other, other examples of where they merged uh, the precincts as well, not just Magnolia. So behind all that, obviously, it takes money to run these elections, right? Is it really based on finances as to which polls are open and which ones are closed? Well, th that may be part of it because the, the, the resources that are provided are by the state to each party. Uh, at the end of the uh, election day, uh, the county clerk's office submits an invoice to each party saying you owe us so much for these resources that we provided you and the funding that they receive from the state. That's how they take care of uh, uh, the cost of an election. Uh, so when you say from the state, we're talking about the state Democratic Party? Or no, the, the state, state of Texas. Texas. Okay. The state of Texas. Okay. So uh, that may be in the election code that there's so much uh, they can do. Um, there's uh, restrictions as to how you can spend the money. For example, we can only bill them for so many things. You can, we can't bill them for something that's not on the okay list of the Secretary of State mm -hmm. of Texas, right? So. Uh, that's the way it works. So that may be part of it. The other part is that, that uh, to conduct an election, for example, you mentioned uh, the Decevalo Park uh, issue. Uh, in 2012, they were also four precincts that were consolidated at that location, and there was only 230 votes cast on election day at that location. So each party 
when they're doing their uh, allocations of polls, what they do is they look the history of elections and pres presidential primary elections in Harris County. And uh, I'll give you an example. In 2000, uh, countywide, total number of votes cast in Harris County in the Democratic primary was 56,000 voters, 56,000. 2004, you had 78,000. And then 2012, they went to, down to 76,000. So uh, the only aberration or outlier, as they call them, was 2008 when there were 410 voters because of the uh, excitement generated by the Obama-Clinton uh, uh, nomination uh, process, fight for the nomination of the Democratic Party. So when you're a party, uh, and I can understand what the chair and what folks do is you sit down and look at the history of voting in primaries and you ask, well, which one are you going to believe? The three where the vote was really low or are you going to believe the one that stood out? So, and this planning starts like way back in, in August and they uh, continue on through uh, September, October and as you get closer to the election. So they have to actually estimate turnout and at that time, People were basically saying the nominees are going to be uh, Jeb Bush and uh, Clinton on the other side. That, for the most part, except for 2008, by the time the primary elections get to Texas, the nominees been decided. So there's really uh, the parties don't spend much money. The national parties don't spend much money uh, getting people out to vote, and that's been the history here in Texas. And as a consequence, you have the parties uh, saying, well, we're probably not going to have uh, the turnout that, uh, that occurred in 2008. It's going to be more like the turnout in 2012. By any chance, do you know what the numbers were actually for this election? For, for this, this part? For, um, <laughs> I, you know what, I, I was going to look at it before I came, but you can actually go to Harris Votes and look at the, uh, the um, the precinct by precinct result. And the four precincts that were at Decevala, you can total up the votes. I can tell you that in 2008, I mean 2012, there were 76,000 voters that participated in the Democratic primary. This time around, I believe there were like 229,000, about 230,000. And in the uh, Republican primary, overall, we had like 557,000 voters Incredible. combined two two primaries in 2008 we had like 585,000 so or 82,000 so uh, we were only like 20,000 plus short of the record that was set in 2008 so that's just the nature of elections people have to make projections the parties made projections uh, as to what they thought was going to happen and as we went along we who assisted them in saying, look, it looks like it's going to be higher than what you think. So let's add some more machines. And even then, uh, it was still higher than, than the adjustments that were made. So you continually have to look at it. There's always ways, uh, in fact, you know, our office is, is saying, well, we need to figure out how we can assist the parties to come up with a formula that actually works, that is closer to what the turnout was. Because we did see by uh, Thursday, I believe, of the first week of early voting, we noticed that the vote was higher, uh, was 115 percent higher daily total in the Democratic primary. So uh, when they had estimated maybe in the less than 100,000, we thought, you know what, it looks like it may be beyond 165,000. But it turned out that it was even higher than 165,000. So there's That's a lot of voters. It's, there is no exact science. What people need to understand that that the parties uh, have to look at the history because you well you know we have presiding judges that sometimes complain. Why do I have to put out so many machines? And normally they in a typical primary in the past they spend their day sitting down and. They have to find <coughs> ways to entertain themselves most of the time because they really are not having any voters come in. Well, they you guys have. made CNN news. <laughs> uh, so, when I was watching the news, I, I think it was like 7.30 p.m., 8, 8 p.m., you see this long line in Decebala Park, and obviously it's dark outside. Yeah. You have lights from the park. And uh, what, what you will, 
I'm familiar with Tesavala, so I can tell you there's no waiting area inside the park. So everybody that was waiting to vote has to wait outside. So it could have been, normally you have buildings where people are in line and you can't see them because they're inside. So but how do they, because I, I know they have to do a cutoff, right, at 7 p.m.? Yeah, but everybody, anybody that was in the line by 7 o'clock. Yeah, but how do you track vote. that? I mean, they're who, supposed to, uh, the presiding judge is supposed to go out there and they count them off and say, here's, here's where where it stops. But what so, if they cut in? <laughs> well, uh, the goal is to try to get everybody processed. Now, okay. <laughs> now uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, it's always challenging when you're running an election that's ordered by the commissioner's court, which are our elections, like the November elections. And it's just as challenging working with the parties to try to get it right. Uh, uh, and it's the, uh, the commitment of the county clerk's office is to get it right and to work with the parties as best we can uh, uh, based on the input that we receive from the citizens. What happened, um, we take it seriously, we look at it, and then we meet with the parties to make sure that those, uh, those, those things that were challenges are worked out and we, we can address them. Now, we have a primary runoff for each party, March 24th. I believe the Democratic Party has 11 elections and the uh, Republican Party has about six elections. And That's countywide. It's going to be countywide because there's some things that are there statewide. So, so that's the challenge. That are, now the question is, how much for the parties, how much equipment do you want? Because primary uh, runoffs are primary low voting events. So the question based on what happened on uh, uh, March 1st, what do you do for the runoff election? So those are the type of challenges. It's not easy making the, the folks that have to make the decisions, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing. So what are the hot races going on that are going to bring out those folks to come out and vote besides um, what's going on at the state level? Well, here locally, oh, I actually looked at the, uh, well, for the Democratic Party, I think there's a statewide race for railroad commissioner. The, there's a state board of education, District 6. The state board of education? And then there's the state representative district. Only one? State uh, reps? And then like there's three judicial positions. Okay. So they're kind of spread and, out. And the county sheriff. And then you have a, a couple of uh, uh, justice of the peace runoffs contest. Uh, precinct 1 and Precinct 7. So. I'm sure that every candidate is going to do the best they can to get the people that voted in those districts uh, out again on March. So the of the May races that you mentioned, election. the ones that would interest me would be the constables race, the justice of the peace, and the state rep seats. The railroad commissioner, most folks don't even know what that is. <laughs> you know, they don't even know what that person is in charge of yeah. at the state level. That's oil and gas, by the way. Yeah, and the... Uh, Probably the most famous railroad commissioner is George P. George P. Bush. That's right. And, yeah. uh, but he's he's not on the ballot. So probably the future governor of Texas. Well, maybe. But uh, uh, so yeah. So I would say that um, leading up to the election, we're gonna because um, we have another uniform election date going on before May 24th, which is the May 7th uniform election date. And uh, for that one, we are we the county clerk's office is in charge of one election which is the uh, state representative district special election 139 from 139 uh, which was vacated by the mayor when he became mayor so that's a special election that's going on so people need to uh, we're going to put up the information pertaining to that election as we near the election and also for the primaries so because there's a vacancy why isn't that election on the same time as everybody else's election why why do you have to have a separate date for that uh, it's in the code that uh, that any time anybody vacates a position, the next uniform election date, uh, the governor can order the election at the next uniform election date. So, because the March for <clears throat> the mayor won in November, last November, uh, during a primary election, you can't you can't have a special election during a primary. I did not know that. So there's two uniform election dates in the state of Texas. One is in May and then one in November. And you have to, so the law says, 
the election has to take place at, uh, during the next uniform election date, and that is May 7th, and that's why it's, it's on May 7th. That's incredible. Well, we're going to take a little break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about some numbers. So the demographics of the actual voters and what you expected and what actually came out. So join us in two minutes. We'll be back. I'm your host, Ben Mendes, joined by our guest from Harris County, Mr. Hector De Leon. And by the way, this is live television, and we are filming in the Houston Media Source, which is just east of downtown, just east of Minute Maid Park. So we are actually in the neighborhood. In case you've never been here, we're right off Harrisburg. Wow, and that's it's a great location. It's convenient, and the weather's great today. They said there was going to be a cold front. I didn't feel the cold. Did it's you? sweater uh, day. You felt so the cold? It's, uh, it was a little cool in the morning and it's still a little fresh but uh, it uh, feels good and today we are talking about the elections actually the past election and future elections and we're going to talk a little bit about the demographics from just recently now you said you had mentioned that we had almost record number uh, for actual people that voted but it didn't quite meet the expectations from the president obama race the first time he ran so take us back in 2008, what were the numbers? Well, overall, the numbers in 2008 uh, were, in total, we had about 582,000 voters combined, Republicans and uh, Democratic primary. For Harris County. Right. And in, in uh, most of them were, uh, the voters participated in the Democratic primary, uh, about 410,000. In this so instance. what percentage was that? Uh, you know what, uh, I, I didn't do the, the math, but it's the 410 out of 582. Okay. And this time around, there were more participants in the Republican primary. And it was like 320-something, I believe, to 
twenty nine or something. So they flipped. Like that. So there was more right. Republicans on this so side. So there was more excitement in the uh, in the Republican primary, but overall, both there was a record turnout for Republicans, and uh, this was the the highest uh, turnout for Democrats ever. <laughs> I guess I guess the highest was in twenty oh eight, which was four hundred and ten. This time around, it didn't go up to 410, but it was very strong and probably uh, second highest ever recorded here in Harris County. So do you think that there was a lot of Democrats that switched over and voted in the Republican primary? Well, in Texas, uh, people don't register to vote by party. <clears throat> so you're a free agent. And uh, during each election uh, season, uh, if, for example, in 2014, if you voted in the Democratic primary, you could have decided that in 2012, I mean 2016, you can vote in a Republican primary if you want. The only thing you can't do is during an election season, for example, if you voted in the Democratic primary in on March 1st and you choose to vote again, uh, you can only participate in the Democratic primary. You can't cross over. If you cross over to the Republican primary, then you're breaking the law. So you can't do that. So uh, uh, but as far as being a free agent, once you get to November, you can choose to vote whichever way you want. So in your opinion, about how many Democrats actually crossed over to vote in the Republican primary? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know because, uh, because people don't register by party. You can't actually uh, um, know if a person voted whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. What we do know when it comes to Spanish surname data, uh, what we do know is that in 2008, uh, we had 82,000 Spanish surname voters, the highest number of uh, Spanish surname voters ever to participate in a primary. And out of those 82,000, only 11% voted in the Republican primary. So 89% voted Democrat? Wow, incredible. But in 2016, on March 1st, we had 76,000 Spanish surname voters, which is almost about the same as we had in 2008. Uh, and in this time around, 41% of those voters voted in the Republican primary. Compared to 11%. To 11%. So there was a jump of 30% almost. It was a big, well, when you look at numbers, it was like a 200, 300% increase of Spanish surname voters in the uh, Republican primary. So and obviously it was the candidates that were running that caused that. Well, it could, you know, you look at what people always say, you know, people, uh, how come more people don't vote? And uh, from my experience with the county and my years in the community and trying to get people out to vote, I realized that uh, what pulls people to the polls are what's on the ballot, candidates or propositions. And that's what pulls people to the polls. And in this instance, if you had 76,000 people or so voting, maybe more, and uh, out of those, 41% voted in Republican primary, which is actually pretty significant. Well, that, people are not even point. talking about that, but that's, that is significant because uh, um, Edison Research did a, an exit poll for uh, the networks, which was reported, and uh, they found that almost 90% of the, that vote was, was uh, divided among uh, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, uh, Ted Cruz, I, I believe, received in the high four, uh, 30s of the Hispanic vote in the Republican primary, Marco Rubio in the high 20s, and uh, Donald Trump in the low 20s. So overall, 90% of the Spanish surname voters turned out to vote for these candidates. Isn't that amazing? Mostly for uh, Rubio and Cruz. You know, all this anti, what I call anti-Hispanic rhetoric or anti-Latino rhetoric from Trump, and yet 20% of the Latino community supported Mr. Trump. Um, that's what the exit poll said. <laughs> that's incredible. So uh, I don't know what people see in Trump, but uh, I don't like the guy. Well, all I can tell you is that uh, we know that people respond to messages and they respond to candidates for whatever reason. And people, we live in a you know, free nation free society you can choose to vote for whoever you want to and that's just the way it goes and uh, but the uh, what needs to be said though is that the vast majority of the people that voted the Spanish surname voters 
uh, voted for either Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio. So uh, when you look at it, as far as what may happen in uh, November, it could be, I'm not sure what, the, what it says, but there's a possibility that people need to pay attention that Hispanic voters actually look at who's running and when they see somebody that they may see, find some affinity to, that they're willing to, to vote for them. So uh, I still think that you can't take I guess the point is you can't take the Hispanic vote for granted and just assume that they're going to come your way because historically that's what's happened. When you have a uh, uh, just within the last couple of weeks, you had two candidates in the Republican Party, major candidates. They're running for president of the United States and they were receiving a lot of money uh, and were being backed uh, by major forces in the Republican Party in the nation. And you see that, and uh, you know, a lot of the time, because uh, we live in, you know, people think in partisan terms all the time that they're, they, they don't see what's happening and they don't comment on it. But the reality is, imagine there's still a possibility that the nominee for the Republican Party will be somebody that's named Rafael Cruz may be the nominee uh, for the Republican Party for President of the United States. I still don't see how people can support Trump, okay? Uh, Senator Cruz, that's a stretch also. I mean, if you ask me, uh, I don't see a, a very good candidate in the Republican side. And some would argue there's not a very good candidate on the Democratic side. So I guess the worst of the two evils is what people are looking at. I, I don't know, but I guess what, uh, my, my point is that, that it is a historic election. Whatever your feelings are, partisan feelings are, it's a historic election and people do need to pay attention that, that uh, on one side people talk about uh, uh, the historic friendship between the Hispanic community and a given party, but you don't see it, it reflected in candidates. And in Texas, particularly in Texas. But on the other side, they really don't talk about, uh, well, they don't, what you see is Hispanic candidates that are elected statewide. I mean, you have George P. Bush, obviously he has a famous name, but uh, uh, you have, uh, the, whether you like him or not, it is a fact that uh, Ted Cruz, his father is Hispanic. Cuban. And, and he is from Houston, Texas, and right. he is a United States Senate, one of 100 United States Senators in the United States of America, and he is Hispanic by definition. And uh, I think there's, uh, that's just a fact that whether people may say, well, you, you're, you, obviously, I bet there's some people out there saying, you must be a Republican. I'm just telling you what the fact is. No, I hear you. It's, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the possibilities of having a president or a VP on the Republican side that's Latino and a VP candidate that's Latino on the Democratic side. People are gonna have to make a decision. They, they, everybody wants to see a, a Latino in our community, a Latino be in the White House one day, right? So it'd be interesting. So if you have a Republican that is the presidential nominee that is Latino, and the VP over here on the Democratic side, who are Hispanics going to vote for? That's, that's, uh, we don't know. I mean, well, that so, be... So if you had Senator Cruz, and let, let's just say Mr. Castro was the VP candidate for Hillary, Hillary Clinton, and they both run as a tag team against the Republicans, that will make history, first of all, because we would have Latinos running against each other at the top of the ticket. So... Your thoughts on that? The only thing I would say is that for historically, most people only care who's at the top of the ticket, not a, a second banana. So <laughs> if, well, that might be true, just, but uh, you know what? I kind of like seeing Castro as a VP in the White House because all that means is that he might be next in line to be president. Well, all I would say is that, uh, that uh, to that is that it, everything that's happening when it comes to uh, Spanish surname voter participation and candidates seeking public office at the highest levels in the United States is that 
there is uh, progress being made despite what, you know, there's always naysayers saying, you know, people don't vote or people won't vote for Republicans or people won't vote for such and such or whatever. But we're seeing that not everything that the pundits or experts say actually the talking happens. Heads. The What's talking happening heads. is yeah. in the end, the people at the bottom, or not, not at the bottom, but the people will de determine and will decide who it is that they want. And uh, I've always felt there's always a disconnect between the leadership and the people. And you, you're seeing that played out in this instance at the national level. So uh, where there's insurgent campaigns from what they call outsiders. And the last remaining candidates on both, um, well, on one side, I guess in the Democratic side, you have an insurgent and on the Republican side, you have people that are perceived to be outsiders that are still the two major uh, candidates left in the contest. I find it kind of interesting that President Obama is reaching out to the Cubans today, actually since yesterday. And so now Cubans don't have such a bad taste in the mouth when you talk about Cuba and U.S. relations. So how does that make Senator Cruz, a, I guess, a more formidable candidate because he's from Cuba or his parents are from Cuba? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I will tell you that my wife's mother is Cuban and her father is Spanish, who um, they, they were in Cuba when, uh, when uh, they, she was born in Coral Gables, Florida, but her family was in Cuba. And the reason they had to leave is because of the Castro Revolution. And it is difficult, you know, I, going to the University of Houston and you know how Everybody who uh, is at school, at university in the United States at one point or another thinks they're Che Guevara. <laughs> but they really don't understand. And I'll tell you this, this is uh, something my mother-in-law told me. When <clears throat> the revolution was happening and they started moving, they went into her hometown, home city, Santa Clara, Cuba. And Che Guevara was leading the forces and they were fighting in the tallest building in the city, which was owned by her father. Her father was, was the, the, the child of a, a woman on the side, but he worked really hard and built a business, became an entrepreneur and built a hotel in that city. He, ha he, we became, he made himself a man of means. And when the Castro Revolution happened, it wasn't like he was uh, born and they, were, they gave him a silver spoon and he was rich. He was actually, again, the, the child of a woman on the side that was never recognized by his father's family, but he made something of himself. And when the Cuban revolution happened, guess what happened? He left this hotel in Santa Clara and his homes and the things that he owned. Somebody just came and decided, you know what, you have too much. And he left and he went to Miami. And when you are of Mexican origin, I am of Mexican origin, and I think it's difficult for people who are not Cuban to understand the issue because my wife is a presiding judge for the Democratic Party, presiding chair in one of the precincts for the, and she will tell you that when people start talking about Cuba and they're not Cubans, they really don't know what they're talking about because it's sort of like you have a business. You, you're an engineer and you have a business and you work hard to build something for yourself and your family to provide for them. Imagine one day somebody comes and says, you know what, Ben, you have too much. You need to share it with the people. That's what happened to their family. They wound so, up in Miami with only what they could take. So basically, there's still a lot of resentment. There's still the question is uh, a lot of the Cubans that came initially are saying, well, what happens to what we had? Who owns it? It's still there. Do they need to have reparations like they talk about here? Reparations. Are you going to pay me for my property and the things? Or are you going to pay that they took from uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my uh, wise grandfather, maternal grandfather? You see, those are the issues that we, we have can to have be a discussed. whole other show talking about Cuba. So let, let me refocus <laughs> again. <laughs> so, Enrique over there, our producer, is like, what's going on here? <laughs> so, let me refocus. So, we have an election basically that 
a lot of Latinos voted in the Republican primary, okay? Now, do you see that those same people that voted in the primary are going to do the same thing in the general election, where we're going to have a lot of Latinos voting in the Republican general election, if you will, uh, for Republicans? Uh, my feeling is that if the nominee is, is somebody named Rafael, you will see people cross over. You will see them, despite, despite what, what uh, people say, well, his, his, uh, his position on certain issues are harsh. Well, uh, Donald Trump's positions on certain issues are harsh, but according to the uh, exit poll done by Edison Research, he got 21% of the Hispanic vote. I and he's can't. not Hispanic. I still don't understand that. <laughs> well, my I mean, point somebody, is that somebody if, has to if Hispanics are one percent <laughs> Latino voting for Trump. So if some Hispanics are willing to vote for Trump uh, uh, at twenty one percent, imagine what they will do for somebody named Rafael Cruz. So don't take it as a given that Hispanics will just fall in line and vote the way people think that traditionally they vote. It's not. We've seen this election cycle that there's many things that are happening. They're not going according to uh, the plan. The plan, will. yeah. Yeah. So speaking of the plan, you know, there's a lot of talk that perhaps that the Republicans have something going on at the convention if nobody gets the majority or actually the actual number of delegates in the Republican side uh, of their camp. Now, I will tell you that if Trump doesn't get, what is it, 1,200? 1,270 the, delegates? Uh, a little, oh, yeah, above 1,200, yeah. Okay, if he doesn't get those delegates, there is going to be infighting within the Republican primary to be the nominee, right? So they're talking about candidates from the floor actually becoming the nominee for the Republican side. Now, how true is that? I don't know. But it'll be very interesting, the dynamics with the Republicans fighting against each other if Trump does not get the nomination. Now, you see all the stuff that's going on in the rallies, uh, the, the Trump rallies. I mean, there's, there's a lot of fighting going on. Uh, people don't actually see everything that goes on outside of the rallies. But there, there's actually fights going on because of this political process that we have and Trump being an instigator for all this. Now, it'll be interesting if the Republican candidates that are still in actually continue as they are continue fighting for the delegates, and none of them reach the 1270 mark. Well, both parties have a process to determine who their nominee is going to be if somebody, a candidate fails to uh, obtain or get to the number of delegates they need to win the nomination outright. So uh, there is a process, not just for the Republican Party, but for the Democratic Party. So. I wouldn't call it necessarily infighting. I would just call it there's a process that exists for people for a party when uh, a candidate, no candidate, reaches the number of delegates they need to win the nomination. So they have to go through a process where they ballot first ballot who gets so many, then uh, second ballot, third ballot, and, I, and there's you know negotiation going on. See who coalesces with the coalitions uh, that are uh, this, and who actually gets to the number. And that is not necessarily new to American uh, politics. It's something that is, has existed forever. Well, In they fact, say Abe Lincoln became yeah, president because of that. Process. Right, and even before then, it used to be that uh, they would they would ballot, and whoever got the most votes would become president, and whoever got the second most votes would become vice president. And it wasn't where a president chose who their nominee and their vice president was going to be. So it you're going to have just, to explain this process to me because I'm not real familiar with it. So let's say they go into the convention and not not any of the candidates have 1,270 delegates. So are you saying that they'll put like Trump's name out there and say, all of y'all vote, and if they have to read, a, what, a majority of votes? Or how does that work? No, they have to get the number. 1,270. Yeah, they have to get whatever the number is. That's from what I understand. So... So they'll do what they do at a convention. You know how they have this, uh, this the, the, where they go, uh, Texas, and he says, Madam Secretary, Texas vote, give so many delegates to such and such, and so many delegates, blah, 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 that process. Okay. But actually it would be meaningful this time around because 
it would matter. Before, it's just ceremonial. People so, know that somebody already received, up to, has the number of delegates to win the nomination. So all that process is just ceremonial. In this instance, if they, they went to that process, it would actually be very important because people would have to pay attention to see who's getting how many delegates, first ballot and then second ballot. And they keep going, I believe, until somebody gets the, the number. number. Yeah. So this goes back to all the delegates that the other states that voted for candidates that are no longer in the race. Like, for instance, Ms. Rubio, Senator Rubio, had X number of delegates. So all those delegates are going to have to figure out who they're going to support this time around, right? Because all those delegates are up for grabs for all those candidates like Ben Carson and all those other uh, candidates that had some delegates. So if you have a big pot of delegates that need to pick a new winner, so to speak, that might change the the, the wave, if you will, in which direction no, they decide to go. From uh, media reports and news stories, uh, what, what I've seen is that uh, the chair of the the uh, or yeah of the uh, Republican convention is going to be the Speaker of the House. So he said he basically has said, if if uh, no candidate reaches the magic number, a candidate will be selected from the people who are running for president of the United States. Because I think there's uh, people have bandied about that or has suggested that somebody some other choice Mitt would Romney come in or, or Paul Ryan himself or some other right. candidate. And what he stated is, and the, the chair of the Republican Party has stated, is that the candidate will come from the people that are running for president of the United States. And you know what? I think that's great. I think that's the way it should be. So let's talk about the Democratic side. So we have, obviously, Hillary Clinton and Bernie. Now, Bernie... Uh, he's made some progress, but still behind uh, Hillary Clinton. I don't see uh, Bernie giving Hillary much of a fight. Well, based on, uh, again, the uh, news stories, people are already uh, giving the uh, nomination to uh, Clinton. And, yeah. and what, they're, what, they're, uh, what people are just uh, conjecturizing about is... is um, who, what happens if for some reason she can't be the nominee? That's what the conjecture is, and the stories are being, being written. Who will be, who will replace her for some reason? Uh, she winds up not being the nominee for some legal reason, right? So they because, talk about... Because of the issues that she had with the yeah, emails? Yeah, so people are talking about that. So I, th my, I guess my point is that the media is already crowned her as she's on her way and there's no turning back and the only question is uh, will something happen between now and the convention and after the convention or something uh, uh, so all, all I can tell you is that um, uh, I don't see it happening um, Enrique if you give us a little white shot here we have a I guess and what I would call the guard that's been there forever Clinton the family's been there for a long long time and then you have a newcomer, Trump. Uh, most folks are tired of the establishment. Okay? They're tired of the Republican establishment. They're tired of the Democratic establishment. Now, I would, I would hope that Trump would not be the president. But let's just say he does become the president. You're going to have the big fight with the Supreme Court justice that's being nominated. Of course, everybody's trying to put a stop to that in the Republican Party so that the new president will vote, will have a say-so on the nomination of the Supreme Court justice. Now, how does all, all that play in, into the political thing uh, when you have a Supreme Court justice that is supposed to be elected or actually voted on by the senators? Well, I think we're probably getting ahead of ourselves because... Uh, at this point, part of the, on, on the Republican side, when you actually, if you're paying uh, close attention to what is being said, is that the uh, main candidate, his, uh, Trump's opposition, is basically saying the reason they should vote for him is because 
uh, he is a conservative and the Republican Party is a party of conservatives and you can't nominate somebody who's not a conservative to be the nominee for the GOP. So if that actually happens, then uh, there's a, a good chance that if, if uh, uh, somebody doesn't reach the number of delegates they need to, to be the nominee, that something may happen that it, uh, it will be a, the representative of the GOP is going to be somebody who is in line with the conservative principles of the Republican Party. So well, I guess to the reason I'm saying uh, people are getting ahead of themselves is that when it comes to the issues of Supreme Court nominees and so on and so forth, uh, actually, Senator Cruz is making the point that you can't trust somebody who's not a conservative to be nominating uh, a, a justice to the Supreme Court. If you're a Republican, that's why uh, he's trying to make his case that he should be the nominee of the GOP for Cru president. Cruz's. Yeah. Okay. Because so the well, issue. Cruz has history with the Supreme Court. You know, he has won more cases against the, the Supreme Court, in front of the Supreme Court, than any other attorney. I found that out the other day. Now, that's pretty impressive. So, so Senator Cruz wants to make the appointment, basically, is what he's saying. He wants to be voted as president because he is supposedly the conservative. Now, I don't buy that. I, I think that President Obama has every right to nominate someone and the senators should vote on the nominee. Whether down or up, they need to vote on it. Well, the way the process works is that, yes, the Constitution says that the president has the power to nominate when a president, when there's a vacancy in the Supreme Court, on the Supreme Court, a president has uh, the authority to nominate a, uh, a, a justice to the Supreme Court. But at the same time, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but people need, to, you know, people need to just read the Constitution, and it does say the president has that authority, but it also has, it says that the Senate has the power to uh, confirm or... Deny or vote and, against. And that's where we are. That's just the way the process works. A lot of people like to say, well, people can't agree. They get into fights. There's always a fight between people who are saying yes and people who are saying no. That's the way the, <laughs> the system was designed for people to have discussions and then decide and move forward. Now, we've seen that lately there's been more disagreement than agreement. But it doesn't mean that is wrong. It means that that's just the way the system is designed. At so, some points, it will work a lot smoother because of the personalities that are involved. And well, there may be some instances where there's more disagreement because of the personalities that are involved. I'm okay with the senators voting down the nominee, but they still need to go through that process. The way it looks right now is they're not even going to have a vote for the Supreme Court justice nominee. Now, Interesting enough that there's been presidents that have nominated Supreme Court justices that have been denied by the senators, okay, over and over and over again during one presidency. Now, that can happen again. I don't see a problem with that, but they still need to go through the process. Well, all I can tell you is that the way the system is designed, the way the Constitution is written, the president has the right to nominate and the Senate has a right to say no. Absolutely. And uh, you can take it a further, uh, further by basically saying that the Senate sets up some rules within the Senate that, that they, they can object to something even before it gets to a vote. And that is just part of the, the way they designed the system within the Senate. So, Everybody's actually abiding by what the rules are. Nobody is actually breaking any rules or, or doing anything that's unconstitutional. Everything that is happening in D.C. is just part of what the process entails, that you have a two-party system that in some instances they choose to agree on an issue, and then 
In other instances, they choose to disagree. And it just happens, like I said, that in, uh, it may be because uh, uh, now we have a lot more communications and uh, different platforms, social media, broadcast media, print media, that you have more uh, avenues where people find out about the fights that are going on or the disagreements that are going on at NDC when in the past you may have had those disagreements but nobody knew about them because there nobody was reporting on them. Right, the media so, has blown up basically all so, these disputes. So the bottom line is that uh, you're right, there's a, there's a process going on and the public needs to know that is not unconstitutional. It's just part of, that's how uh, the Federalists, I mean, the, uh, the founders design the process. And uh, I would highly recommend for people to uh, read Federalist Number 10, the Federalist, Federalist Papers. Number 10? The Federalist Papers and what, Federalist, what Federalist Number 10 was written by James Madison, which was one of the, the, the oh. father of the Constitution. And he basically said this in his argument, it, the Federalist Papers were actually uh, produced to make the case. That's the way they promoted the Constitution. They, uh, to promote the Constitution, to make sure that every colony ratified the Constitution. So they're making the case that in this government, the way it's set up uh, is that uh, there will be some instances where there'll be disagreements. If you have 10 people and you need to pass a, uh, a uh, make a decision on an issue, in some instances you'll have six people siding on the issue. Then there'll be other instances where there'll be six people also siding on an issue, but it'll be different. The combinations of people will be different. That's what, how the system is designed to work. Now, well, now whether that nowadays, is working now. Nowadays you have Republicans on one side and the Democrats on another side, basically. But you have people that will, you know, for whatever reason, say, well, you know what, in this instance, I'm going to side on this side. And on other issues, they'll say, well, I'm going to side on this. So there's still a group of, of very small, probably, of, of uh, representatives from both parties that say, you know what, this time around, I'm going, I'm going with them. And other instances, they say, I'm, but the group is small. And... And sometimes, you know, they, uh, they have to be courageous because... Uh, I, I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about Adrian Garcia and Gene Green race. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Let's talk a little bit about the dynamics in that race. Obviously, uh, Congressman Gene Green had been there, what, 24 years, 25 years? 23. 23 years as the congressman. And so he was running in a hard race. A lot of people thought Adrian Garcia was pretty much didn't have a shot. And so why he was running for Congress, a lot of folks didn't know why. You know, They didn't understand the politics. Now, it's kind of interesting. If you go back in history, uh, Gene Green won that seat back in 2000, oh, 1992. He won that seat. He ran against Councilman Ben Reyes. And that seat was created for a supposedly a Latino, right? And Gene Green ended up winning the Latino congressional seat and has been in that seat ever since. So Adrian Garcia recently ran against him. And you would think because uh, Adrian was Latino that Latinos would support Adrian. But your, st your stats show differently. They showed that uh, we had a lot of Latino voters that supported Gene Green. So let's go over some of those numbers. Well, what you see is... Uh that at best, um, Garcia received between 55 to 60 percent of the vote. And for a Hispanic candidate to actually win that district, he would have to get an overwhelming majority of the Hispanic vote. I'm talking about like 75 percent of the vote. To have a shot. To, to win. Okay. And he, he didn't come close to doing that. So are you saying that he got like 55 percent of the Latino vote? About 55 to 60 percent. So Gene Green got 45 percent of the vote, more or less? Wow, that is, that is high. That is very high. I would have thought he would have done a lot better in the Latino community. What about the other communities? Are you familiar with those numbers? Well, when you actually look at turnout and you look at by demographics, you see that obviously Garcia uh, and Green, they, the vote was closer 
uh, the more Hispanic a district is, the better Garcia did, or he was able to match the vote that Green was getting. But the less Hispanic a precinct was, mm. the less vote that Garcia received. So, so how about in the African-American precincts? The, all I can tell you is the less Hispanic a precinct was, the less, and what you need to know that even in precincts that are 80, according to the census, are 80 percent or more Hispanic pop, uh, voting age population, uh, they were about uh, between 25 to 34 percent of the vote was non-Spanish surname voters. So when you look at the, the vote, like I said, precincts that are 90 percent or more Hispanic, according to the census, they split 48.6 for Garcia, 48.1 for green, but what, but there was at least a percent of those voters who were not non-Spanish surname voters. So that skews the percentage. Sure, sure. But when you actually look at precincts that are by themselves, you see that that it was about 55. To, to, uh, he received like 55 percent to 60 percent of the vote. So well, he I wanna, needed more. I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's always good to have you, Hector. I, I know that you're a very busy man, and appreciate you coming on at last minute notice. Well, thank you for inviting me. And we look forward to the next election. Talk a little bit about those numbers. I, I know the primary election, the runoff election is what date? May 24th. May 24th is election day, so make sure you get out there and vote. Again, you're listening to Latino Talk TV, and my name is Ben Mendes, and Hector De Leon was our guest today. Appreciate you coming out. We'll see you next week. <laughs>